Well, it's good to meet together again. We're on our journey to the cross, and I'd like to read from Mark 14, verses 3 to 9. Um, I've called this uh, short message a picture of worship. So Mark 14, and then from verse 3. While he, that is the Lord Jesus, was in Bethany, reclining at the table at the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached, throughout this world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So, a picture of worship. Um, Whatever else we might do in life, above all else, we have been called to be worshippers. Every man, every woman have been put on this earth, as I say, above everything else that we might do. We've been made to worship the God who made us. And yet it's incredible how distorted that has been. In other words, the people, or those without the the Holy Spirit, um, have a view of worship that is so so, uh, beyond what uh, God would have us think. For instance, um, someone think that that God is uh, like a celestial vampire who wants to suck all the joy out of us, wanting us to bow and scrape uh, around this God. And yet... uh, the real thing is very, very different, as we're going to see this morning. I guess it's reasonable for a person to ask, if there's a God, what does he desire of me? What does he want from me? Maybe that's what you're thinking this morning. Well, what does God want of me? We could give many answers to that. But uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe, summed it up in this way. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, your mind and strength, And then he said that the second commandment is like it, to love our neighbours as we love ourselves. But that's the first commandment. We are to love God. What does God require of us? That we love him. So what we're going to do is go to this scene where we see um, true worship, I believe, a picture of true worship. Now, um, as we've noticed, as we get to the cross, Um, the the climax of our Lord's ministry. Things are heating up. Um, Jesus has warned his disciples that he must go to the cross, he must be betrayed, he must lay down his life, he must suffer, he must rise again. Um, But the animosity of these religious leaders has now reached fever pitch. And that's come out already in in our build-up, that their hatred, their, their simmering hatred towards God, the God who came into this world to save us. Their hatred towards him now is breaking out in in his most ugly manifestations. But it's in the midst of this darkness that we see the, the, the beautiful light of Christ, God's gracious love shining more brilliantly. And also, coming into stark contrast, those who hate God and those who actually do love him. Let's take a a fly-on-the-wall look, then, at this scene. 
um, only days before what we call the Last Supper, we have this meeting. It's a group of people packed into this, this humble home in uh, Bethany, a small village outside of Jerusalem, and uh, just cast your, around, your eye around this, this room. Um, it's a meal, they've met for a meal. So let's, as I say, a fly on the wall look. And uh, firstly, we would see um, 12 earnest young men. They're the disciples of, of Jesus of Nazareth. Then their host, a man fond, fondly known as Simon the leper. You know, how would you like a name like that? Um, but he's a man who, uh, who was in a dreadful condition, leprosy, but this Jesus had healed and now he's hosting this meal. Then there are two devoted sisters, Mary and Martha. And then there's a young man with gleaming eyes and a heavenly beam on his face who only days before had been a decomposing corpse. And yet, at the command of this Jesus, he had been raised from the dead. And now he is um, sitting at this table and reclining at this meal. But then we'll move on to this outrageous act that sparks such a row at this meal. In verse 3 we read, While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. So, they're sat round, they're perhaps relaxed, I would like to think they're relaxed and enjoying one another's company, but there is a tension here because not all are really convinced of who Jesus really is. And then we have this woman who, um, without any signal, she spontaneously takes a jar, uh, we're told in verse 3 it's very expensive perfume, that this nard, um, it would be imported from India, it would have been made from a plant, very expensive. And we're told in verse 5 that it was uh, worth more than a year's wages. She breaks open the jar and she pours the whole of its contents over Jesus. You can almost hear the intake of breath as all is poured out over him. And it's here that we see the people break into two distinct camps. All of those in this room break into two distinct camps. And I believe the whole of mankind actually, at the last analysis, breaks into these two camps. Those who know and love God and those who do not. Verses 4 and 5. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her. So this stark difference between um, those who are redeemed, we might say, those who know what it is to be forgiven and those who are simply religious. For the merely religious person, you notice that everything is measured out. And this is all the way through the ages. We see this. Those who are simply religious, they might have an outward show of religion. And yet really, when it comes to, to, to giving, and that's what we're looking at now, there, there is a giving. Those who, who, who love God are givers. There is an outflow. There is an overflow. But those who are merely religious, they seem to measure everything. Uh, every service attended is, is measured as though some kind of record were being kept by themselves, Sim simply trying to measure up to a standard. Every good deed done, every penny given to the church or charity, it's all measured, it's all, it's all kudos, it's, it's all good works being uh, built up with the aim of maybe pleasing God. And the underlying thought often is, how little can I give of myself, of my substance? 
how little can I give and yet go to heaven when I die? Could that be you? True worship, and that's what we're seeing here, it always flows from a sense of gratitude. It is an overflow. There is something spontaneous about it. You can't program it. Worship is simply a, a, a response to the grace of God. It's having received from God, having tasted God, having glimpsed what God is really like, then there's a natural response to, to that, a spontaneous response, as we're going to see really to free forgiveness. Now Judas here, one of the twelve, Judas seems to be the, the chief protester at this display of worship, this display of love. Why this waste? This could have been given to the poor. So again, cloaked, the, the, the animosity cloaked, but it really is pretty ugly. I think we could call Judas the almost Christian. He had heard the most wonderful teaching flowing from the gracious lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. He'd seen amazing miracles, people healed, demons cast out, the dead raised before his very eyes. He'd seen it all. And yet himself had preached, he'd healed the sick, he'd cast out demons, he'd done things, he'd done stuff in the name of Jesus. And yet, and this is a solemn thing, he had never been born again. He'd never received the grace of God. He'd never known the life of God. And that's what a true Christian is. A sinful person who's been washed and cleansed and received the very life of God within. Received the Holy Spirit, being born of the Spirit. And so that the life within comes from God, initiated from God. And so worship is a response to having received the free gift that gracious gift. So when we look at Mary's worship here, we might call it her extravagant love. She breaks this jar and she pours it all out. There is an outpouring of, of this ointment, which is simply a picture of the outpouring of her heart towards Jesus. You see, love to Christ, it doesn't count the cost. This most likely was her inheritance. She wasn't a wealthy person, but she's pouring out all that she has here. And she doesn't see it as wasted. She sees it as the most important thing. She doesn't see it as sacrifice. She just wants to, in some way, display her love and gratitude towards this person. And love to Christ doesn't care what others think either. Um, John, in his account, in the Gospel of John, tells us, she poured the expensive perfume on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance. Now, respectable women, they didn't unbind their hair. That was a sign of, a, of an immoral woman. But she lets loose her hair and she dries the Lord Jesus Christ with her hair. Um, so what can produce such a depth of devotion? It can only be that she is aware that this Jesus who's going to die is actually laying down his life for her. And that's what a Christian is really. It's someone who's grasped just what the cross of Jesus Christ is all about. Not that we can understand all what the cross of Christ is. But at that most basic level, we, we can say with Paul that he is the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, that he's dying for me, that when he suffers and bleeds, when he's being mocked, when, when the wrath of God is being poured out on him, when our sin is laid on him, we, we do recognize it is my sin. It is my sin that held him there. 
And so we see that Jesus Christ, he receives worship. Uh, only God can be worshipped. Jesus Christ is God. He receives our worship. And notice how he springs to Mary's defence. Leave her alone, he says. She has done a beautiful thing for me. And then he adds, she did what she could. <laughs> Don't we have that realisation that we fall far short. Those of us who love God, we are painfully aware that our efforts are pathetic, that our love is cold and weak, that we don't give enough, we don't pray enough, we don't read the Bible enough. We're aware of our failures. But it's that realisation that actually Jesus Christ, it, it's his performance, it, it's his life, it's what he has done that brings us peace, not that we try to do. Religion is do, 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 whereas we who are the Lord's, we look to the cross and we see done, done, done. Christ has done it all. Let me finish with this then. The very best that we can offer is pathetically weak. The very greatest act we can do really at the end of the day, are, are nothing much at all. But the incredible thing is that the Lord is pleased when we do the smallest thing we, with a loving and sincere heart. We do it because we love him. And we, we bring every small act of devotion to him and say, Lord, I, I, I do this for you with, with a heart of gratitude for all you have done for me. And the incredible thing is that God does not expect perfection from us. But he does look for lives of love and devotion. So that is true worship, an overflow of gratitude. Let's pray. We want to thank you, our gracious God, for all you have done for us. We can say with the hymn writer, weak is the effort of our hearts and cold our warmest thoughts. But Lord, we want to focus on all that Jesus is and has done. And we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are grateful for that smallest act of sincere worship. We pray, Father in heaven, that you would make us aware of all that you have done in Jesus. And Holy Spirit, come, we pray, and warm our cold hearts that we might overflow in, in deeds and words of love and gratitude. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.